next speaker needs no introduction. Nevertheless, <laughs> I've been asked to introduce him, so I'll tell you an incontestable story. I first saw Sarah in the flesh at the first mathematics I ever went to, which was Woods Hall in 1964. It was the general sense I had that the gods had descended from Olympus. Uh, <laughs> Sarah then was incredibly inspiring, and he's continued to inspire me and many other people throughout his career. It's a pleasure to introduce him to speak about how to use algebraic linear groups. Good, thank you, thank you. So uh, I've put the topics on the board, which usually brings bad luck, because when people make a list of things they want to say, they never say the last one. So I hope <laughs> I will go, hope I, I will say something on the unitary tree. The idea of the lecture is, to explain how you use, in simple cases, algebraic linear groups for questions on groups, of course, even on group representations, but where the group is arbitrary. And the type of group I have in mind, which is far from arbitrary, is a Galois group, an infinite Galois group, and uh, the linear representations are eladic representations. So I will start with uh, Ah, something. Is that okay with? Okay. On tensor products. So let, let me recall you a few definitions. We have a group G. It is a group with no structure at all. It is what in the literature is called very curiously an abstract group. Uh, <laughs> The idea being that quantum groups, formal groups, are concrete, you see, but this one is very abstract. <laughs> that, that is uh, abstract. And uh, you have a field K, and the field K, uh, I think, in uh, essentially everything I will say uh, will be of characteristic zero, but that's not important for the definitions. We'll be interested in linear representations. of G over K, and that means the homomorphism, always noted by Rho, is the, an automorphism of some vector space, V vector space over K of finite dimension. And uh, as you know, there is a notion of irreducibility. Rho or V are called irreducible. If there are exactly two stable subspaces, which of course cannot be anything else than zero and V. So that's another way of saying that V is non-zero and that no intermediate space is stable. So that's irreducible. Now one says that V is semi-simple, rho. Semi-simple if equivalent definitions, V is a direct sum of irreducible. Or a more interesting definition is for every W in V, which is G stable, there is a complement. There is a W prime with W prime plus V equals V and W prime G stable. It's a little exercise to prove that uh, you have that. Now, uh, whenever you have a representation which is not, which is not semi-simple, you can force it to be irreducible by replacing it by the so-called so so semi-simplification. What you do is you take your V, which is what it can be, and you choose a composition series that is a series of subspaces which are G-stable and the, each quotient is irreducible. And now you reduce, you replace V by the direction over VI plus one. The effect of that is that the character, I should have defined the character, the character of rho, that means the function from G to the constants, which is a trace, trace of rho. 
And it is an easy fact that this determines the representation, provided it is semi-simple. Yes, this is to be surprising at first because when you learn group representations, usually you assume G to be finite and you use orthogonality, properties of characters, and so on. No, this is more, much more elementary because, in fact, it's not really a theorem on groups because such a representation gives you a map, K of G from the endomorphism of V. This is an algebra, and the trace makes sense, and the theorem is a theorem on algebra. If you have any algebra, it doesn't have to be finite dimensional, this one is not. And a representation of finite dimension, then it is determined by its trace, provided it's semi-simple. And when you formulate it that way, you have no problem proving it. You should forget about the group. Okay, so that's about what I need on group representations. It's quite simple, but still, the following question comes in a natural way. If you have V1 and V2 are two representations, you can, of course, make up the tensor product over K, that is the representation. And then you have this theorem of Chevalier. I don't know the exact date because it occurred in a book and he proved it probably before, but it's roughly 1950. So I'm sure which says that V1 and V2 should be simple implies V1 tensor V2 should be simple. It looks a very innocent theorem and it is trivial in a few cases. If V1 or V2 have dimension 0 or 1, it is trivial. But if they have, they have dimension two, and you have, if you are clever enough, you can find a direct proof. But except for those cases, it's a bit mysterious. And that is a case, that's the first case I want to show of how you do it using linear algebraic groups. So. Well, the idea is rather simple. At first, you start with your G, and you map it into GL of V1 cross GL of V2. So you make a few preliminary restrictions. First, you could assume the map is an injection, because clearly all that matters is the image. Second thing, you could assume the field K to be algebraically closed. That's a little less obvious, but you have to show that if some representation becomes semi-simple after a separable extension, it, it was be already before. That, that's not difficult. So you can assume all that. Then we can view those things as algebraic groups over K. Now, when, because I identify them with their points. So, when you have uh, such a situation, you can speak of the Zariski closure. Of G. What does that mean? That means that you look at all the polynomials in the coordinates, and also the inverse of the determinant, which are zero on G, and you take the points here, which satisfy all those equations. That is, so, so that you are sure that every algebraic statement you're making about G will be true also in the closure. So call it G bar or something. Now you have an algebraic group. And V1 and V2 are semi-simple. But uh, they are also to be simple as G bar modules. Because whenever something is stable under 
G, that is an algebraic equation, so to speak, on the coefficients on, on G. And so it remains true on G bar. So we have kept all, the, all our hypotheses. That is, we may now assume that G is algebraic. group and the representation are algebraic too. And if we prove the theorem in that setting, we are through. So the next thing is that, well, at the time of Chevalier, one did not know much about algebraic linear groups. But thanks to Chevalier himself later, uh, we we know much more, so I'm going to use what we know now. He had some equivalent things. Right? So what do we know about such things? You have an algebraic group into some GL, because this, you view it into some GL of, of the sum, so GL, GLN, say, algebraic. You have the notion of the unipotent subgroups, now I assume really characteristic is zero. Uh, unipotent subgroup, it means an element, uh, it means a subgroup, whose elements have eigenvalue one, only one, nothing else. So they can be put in triangular form with lots of ones on the diagonal. So that's a unipotent subgroup. Those things in characteristic zero are connected for the Zariski topology, and one shows that there is a maximal normal unipotent subgroup, which is called the unipotent radical. Uh, to show you what it is, uh, take, for instance, a group which would be a triangular group like that. In that case, the maximal normal unipotent is is that. Clearly, all the eigenvalues are one, and that's the best you can do. And so there is a general notion of that. And it has a very useful consequence for linear representations. You have the following theorem. A linear representation, algebraic, of course, a linear algebraic representation of G is semi-simple if and only if it is trivial on the unipotent radical, if and only if it is trivial on the unipotent radical. Okay, so we have that, and now the Sram Chevalier is, is clear because G is embedded there, the representations are semi-simple, so the unipotent radical of G acts by one, but then if it acts by one on V1 and V2, it acts by one on V1 tensor V2. Of course, I'm cheating a bit in the sense that this came later than Chevalier. Uh, the way Chevalier did it was to use the algebra instead. Uh, the idea being that the Lie algebra gives you good information, maybe not on G, but on the connected component. Here, G is not connected. The neutral component. Connected component of the identity. This, more or less, uh, corresponds to Lie, to Lie G. And uh, Chevalier was in the process of doing very precise theorems, uh, theory of algebraic Lie algebras. And he used it to prove the theorem. I learned about it uh, around 50. 
in the following way. Uh, I knew Chevalier had a manuscript on that, but at the time there was no copy there. And Chevalier had the bad habit of having only one copy of his, uh, of his uh, papers. He, even a book of his got lost because of that. But that's a different story. So I asked him about his book. He said, oh, sir, if you want, I lent you the proof sheets, but then you correct them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a deal. Uh, I, I took up the deal, and so if there are misprint, there are misprint in the book, you blame them on me. But I see, but at least I learned about the theorem, so I got something. Okay, so that is Chevalier's theorem, but it has several uh, asides which are interesting, which I want to quote. The generalization, which I think I can attribute to Chevalier and Deligne, if he doesn't complain too much. Not yet. Not, not yet. Okay, good. Uh, the generalization is the following. Uh, when you have linear representations, that's all right, but you could also be interested in semi-linear representations. What does that mean? That means that you still have a field K. Or maybe it was a little K, but I think I prefer to call it now a capital K. It's, it's bigger, so to speak. But now you have an action. Yes, you're going to see. You have an action of G on K. A bit like a Galois action, but with, it could be infinite order. The geometric origin of these things is uh, that you have a variety on which some algebraic group acts, for instance, and you take the function field of the variety. Then you have an action which in general is non-finite. All right, so you have the notion of semi-linear representation. That would mean rho g goes to g L, capital K of v, v ve vector space as before, but then, uh, no, sorry, it's not g L, so it's it's a, I don't know the notation for that. But you mean, I, I mean, for every G in G, you should have a row of G, which is semi-linear. That is, to write completely explicitly, row of G of lambda times a vector V should be equal to well, this is a scalar, so it is in K, so G acts on it, equals G of lambda, rho of G applied to V. So it's semi-linear. So now G is an abstract. G has become abstract again, G abstract. Very abstract. <laughs> well, as you will see, uh, it's getting worse uh, in a moment. All right, so there is no problem. You can define all the, the same thing, semi-simple, tensor product over capital K. Uh, there is a field which deserves to be called little k. It is a fixed field. <coughs> because the homes between two such things are little k vector spaces, but they are of finite dimension. It's OK. And now, the Chevalier theorem which I call Chevalier de Lille, is true. So, theorem, same as before. V1, V2, semi simple. But now the proof is uh, quite a bit more sophisticated because of the presence of the line here. And uh, uh, what you do is you make up, we have, you have first to make up a rather small category out of all the representations of G's, uh, semi-linear, uh, which can be obtained from V1 and V2 uh, by tensor operations and so on. You have to, to make up that, to have a category which is a bit small. And that category is what is called a tensor category. Over little k, because the homes are over little k. 
But the tensor products are taken over, over capital K. And this tensor category has all kinds of good properties, including the fact that it has a fiber functor that is a functor in vector spaces with the usual property, but it has it only over the capital K. And it is a functor V goes to V. Okay, but in that situation, the line proved that this category is equivalent to the category, the tensor category, of representations of a little k algebraic group. And so you don't, because you, for algebraic groups, you know it. And here, I asked Doline if there was a way to, to go through his general constructions, uh, and he told me no. If you, don't, you have not changed your mind? No. It is a bit frightening, uh, especially if you go now to what I'm going to do, to characteristic P. In characteristic P, the definitions go through. And let's go back to Chevalet's theorem. Chevalet was telling you V1 tends or V2 is to be simple always, if V1 and V2 are. Now, in characteristic P, this is going to be true. So Chevalet's theorem is OK if the dimensions are small. And in general, suppose you have a family of VI, the condition is some That's the way I remember it. This, you, you make that assumption. Well, if, if P equals 2, uh, you are not going to get much uh, information, but if P is 691, you, you still uh, f f f find an interesting example. And so that is a theorem. And G is abstract group. Well, I've published a proof of that long ago, but let me just say that there are essentially two ideas. One of them is, of course, to use the same idea as uh, Chevalet, that is to take the risky closure. But that idea is not enough, because your group G could be finite. In Chevalet's case, a finite group was OK, because it's rather simple to prove it. But here, a finite group whose order is divisible by P is just as difficult as the general case. So the next idea was to use a technique that was, uh, I learned from Nori. It may have been earlier, but Nori used it very well, which is the following. Suppose you have, in a vector space, of dimension smaller than P, even equal. And you have an automorphism, sigma, which is of order P. It cannot be of order P squared because, uh, because of that. So it, P is uh, the worst you could have. Then what you can do is the following. You write sigma as one plus epsilon. And because you're in characteristic P, uh, you have epsilon P equal, equal zero. That is the same as this thing here. So this is not only nilpotent, but nilpotent of that type. And that allows you to introduce the powers of 1 plus epsilon. You, you define this to be 1 plus T epsilon, and so on. And uh, uh, this is a map from the final line into the automorphism, into GL of V. And so to speak, you have extended uh, the map of Z mode PZ into that, into a map of the full affine line. And uh, it's a homomorphism. Uh, I'm sorry, this is wrong. This is not that. It is, uh, you, you expand it, plus and so on. 
I think I wrote to the dot, dot, dot. But, but it stops. It stopped uh, at the FMP. And, and you prove uh, rather easily that it is homomorphism. So uh, what is uh, the second idea you have to use? The first idea was to close the group under the Zariski closure. The second idea is to close it under that operation. That is, every time you find an element of order P, you replace it by one parameter thing, which is connected. And so in that way, you, you manage that in the end, the connected component is of index prime to P in G. Oh, and then you have not finished at all. But then you can use a theory of weights and roots and so on, and uh, you, you're in business. Okay, so that is the Chevalier theorem. But now what about Chevalier de Ligne? Chevalier de Ligne, I'm lost. Because if I, ta if, if I start with semi-linear representation, de Ligne theorem applies, but he will tell me, instead of a algebraic group, he, he will tell me, a K-group scheme, which may have the important elements. That doesn't happen in characteristic zero. There are no important elements. But in characteristic P, there could be. But the, the proof that I describe here does not apply to, to a group scheme. For instance, I don't know if the corresponding statement for Lie algebras is true. If you take a characteristic P uh, Lie algebra, you take two linear representations semi-simple. You take the tensor product, you assume that. I don't know. And I would not uh, bet anything on, the, on that. OK, so that's where it is now. And then I think I've done my, the num number one of my. Now, did I do it? Uh, I passed the 20 minutes that I should have used. All right. So the second topic is small characters. Well, again, I want to show that uh, you can do things using algebraic groups that are not obvious from a different point of view. So uh, I, was, I assume again, K of characteristics is zero. I mean by small characters, characters with small va values. So I start with the group G, and uh, well, we have the notion of a character of G, it is a character of some linear representation. There is a notion of a virtual character. It is a difference of two characters. If you want, the first notion was about the actual representations. The second one is about the Grothendieck group. So we make differences. So you have a virtual character. And as you will see in the lecture Wednesday, they play quite a role in counting the points modulo p. That's why we need them. So let me state a theorem. Not very surprising, but still. Uh, let f be a virtual character of G with values in K. And assume it takes only finitely many values. So that I mean it is small in that sense. Then it comes from a finite quotient of G. Of course, so that is a finite group quotient 
for G. Of course, that is the cheap way of making such things. You take a quotient of G, finite, you take any characters you like, you take all the finitely many values, that gives you one of G. The rem is you don't find anything else. Not going to prove in detail, but let, let me explain the, the starting point. Well, the main point is really to prove that there is a subgroup of finite index, a normal subgroup of finite index, such that f factors through that. After that, you have to construct a representation, but uh, I'll do only the first part. So, and the first part is, is very simple, because by the same trick as before, we can assume G is in G and V. Because we had two representations, we have V1, V2, and we do as before. We take, can take the Zariski closure. Why? Because if we take the Zariski closure, it will still be true that the values are the, the same one. Because we have found that many equations, so they are still valid over G bar. And now you use really the one of the best properties of algebraic groups. That is the connected component, the neutral component, as finite index. That's always true in algebraic geometry. That's one of the, of the rare, no, not rare, but of the good things of algebraic geometry. That is. <laughs> With respect to complex analytic or such thing, complex ana analytic, uh, you may have infinitely many components. No, A finite index. So you decompose G into the cosets modulo G0. But now your function is an algebraic function. It is continuous, for instance. So it has to be constant on each coset. And so you have given a subgroup of finite index, namely G0, such that it is constant modulo that. So you have done your, your duty. OK, we can go a bit further if we make more assumptions. And I insist it's a type of problem where if you don't think of taking algebraic, uh, the Zariski closure, uh, I have no idea how you, you would attack that. I mean, yeah, no, but this is really important. So let me give you a more concrete example, which I like. And we will see it again Wednesday, if I do what I expect I will do. Uh, example. So assume f, f is still a virtual character, a difference of two characters. F takes values in a, in a rather small set. That. Then, this can happen only in trivial cases. Then either F is zero or F is a homomorphism from G to, the, to plus or minus one. That's also a cheap way to do that. Or minus F is a homomorphism. And as a curious corollary, image of F cannot be the full thing. Okay, so how do you prove that? Well, it's, it, now that I've proved the previous, or, or at this state of the previous theorem, it's pretty trivial, really. Uh, because now you, you, we can assume G is finite. Because we know that G factors, the character factors, and for a finite group, it's, it's just an exercise. But let, let me do it to show you how trivial it is. 
So, proof. We may assume that by the previous theorem, that uh, G is finite. And then we can, t we can use the theory of, uh, uh, well, we choose an embedding. Doesn't really matter. We, uh, we view the character as a character with value in C, but the, these are clearly in C. There is no, not much embedding to do. So we view those things as complex characters, so we write F as a linear combination of irreducible characters over C. Irreducible and, and distinct, of course, chi i not chi j. I not j. All right, and then we look at uh, Integral of f, f square. Integral over g, that is 1 over g sum f of g square. Well, uh, since uh, f takes value in minus 1, 0, 1, uh, this thing, uh, and also we know that this is, in, this is sum of n i square, so it is in z. Now we see that there is there are only two possibilities. Either f is always zero, okay, that's the first case. Or assuming not, then we must find one and not zero for the integral of the square. So f should always be of absolute value one. But also it is sum of n i square. So how can you have this equal to one? Only one of them has to be non-zero. So you get only one character, or maybe the opposite. And it takes values in this thing. OK, so, 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 you, so the proof is done. By the way, you can continue. And it's a fun exercise to take values in things which are a little more complicated. I looked in values of uh, 0, 3, and uh, uh, one can describe them all, but not so simply as that. Um, there is a curious consequence of that. Uh, as you know, uh, when you have a group G, you can take the representation and make the Grothendieck ring, so say uh, R of G, RG, Grothendieck group with the, the product given by the tensor product. Or if you prefer, that's the ring of all the, of all the virtual characters. That's the same thing. So let's say it that way. Ring of virtual characters. And it states something which looks impressive at first. The spectrum, I mean, you can take the spec of any commutative ring, and this is a commutative ring. So the spec of RG is connected. Well, it's something that I had noticed that for finite groups with a bit complicated proof, but it's really obvious here because we know when, when is a ring commutative ring uh, like that. We know that the only obstruction is idempotent elements. So what we really have to show is that, so this is equivalent to saying, if f in Rg is idempotent, then f uh, is 0 or 1. But you just apply that, because an f which is idempotent satisfies f squared equals f. So it takes values even better in 0, 1. So if you look at what the possibilities for 0, 1 here, yes. the only possibilities are 0 or the homomorphism 1. Okay. 
I don't know. I think somebody uh, is lucky after having seen uh, the question I was asking in my book on this thing, um, has done something for t general tensor categories, but uh, I don't know exactly in what setting. I don't think he can do it in characteristic P, but I'm, I'm not sure, really. So this is a rather trivial application. OK, so I think now I can, ah, I have not lost too much time. I can go to something a bit more mysterious, which is unitary trick. Unitary trick was used by Hermann Weil to explain how you can prove things for uh, complex Z groups, for instance, uh, uh, using compact groups. So I'm going to do something a bit similar. So let me give you an example of what I want to prove. All right, so we start. We start with G, as usual. But here, G will be a compact group. We start with the field K, and that will be a locally compact field, non-discrete, characteristic zero. So that means, in practice, uh, R, C, or a finite extension of a periodic field. I should say an eladic field because that will be the way for some L. Okay, we have that. And we, uh, we start with two linear representations, rho 1, rho 2, uh, from G to uh, GL, uh, V1, V2, which are finite dimension over K and which are continuous. And uh, we are interested in comparing their trace. We want to compare their trace. They could have the same trace, but uh, I'm interested in the case where they have not the same trace. So uh, what is the theorem? The theorem says, that the set of G where trace are, it's simpler to say they're not the same. Trace of rho one G is not trace G um, is either empty. I can't rule that out or of how measure at least one over, well, I would write it B, uh, B square, uh, one over B square, uh, B for bound, where B is dimension of V1 plus dimension of V2. It's a kind of theorems. Uh, you meet such things also when you do modular forms. I mean, you have, uh, you may have representations which uh, are very similar for many primes, and you want to prove they are really uh, isomorphic. So that's the typical thing. Uh, the bound here is not terribly good. Uh, it could be replaced by one over b times soup. Sorry soup of dim v1, dim v2. But even that is not completely optimal. But it's not far from being optimal, especially that one. There are finite groups which have two different irreducible representations which are very close. Their characters are the same for almost all the elements, only just a small proportion. Typically, the so-called Heisenberg type group, groups of the type 
les, les CPI cubes. Uh, they have a representation of degree 3, which are distinguished from one another only by the value on the center. And outside, they are the same. And so they give an example where the bound is, is optimal. OK, so how do you prove that? Now, the amusing thing is that in those two cases, the one I'm interested in for, the, for Wednesday is the second one. We have an analytic field. And G will be a Galois group, an infinite compact Galois group. On the other hand, as you're going to see, the theorem is almost trivial for C. And then the, whole, the idea of this the last part of the, of the lecture is to show you that you can go from, the, if you have the theorem proved in that case, you have it in that case. So let's show first why it is trivial uh, over C. Well, we'll see, it's really uh, nothing at all. You take your f, and you look at the integral. And now it's really the integral of f squared. And uh, f might be 0. So, uh, ah, oh, sorry, thank you, thank you. f is trace of rho, 1 minus trace of rho. I'm keeping the notation of the previous. So you look at that. Now that, can, that is an integer because of the formula on characters. It's an integer, even a positive integer in the sense of Bourbaki, which means that it could be zero, but if it is zero, we are in the case where you have equality and then this space is empty. So we assume we are not in that case, then it is at least one. But on the other hand, what is it? It is integral over G, but over the subspace of G, where F is not zero. You, you don't need to integrate on the rest. And the, that integral is at most the measure mu for the hard measure, normalized hard measure, the measure of the subset, the set of, set of G of G with uh, F of G of zero times the soup of this thing, but this is, cannot be bigger than B. And so you get what you want, because you get one smaller. And if you, to get the refined thing, you integrate, instead of integrating uh, F uh, you integrate the product of f with trace of rho 1, for instance. But the interesting part now remains to show it, that if you have proved any bound of that type, in the case of the complex numbers, you have it in general. So you have to move from the complex to an arbitrary. And that seems a bit difficult because you're using the Haar measure and they look quite different. The Haar measure on the profinite group and the Haar measure on the uh, compact real Lie group, uh, no. So the idea is to use, in, to define instead the third notion of density. Uh, another definition that of density, which will be a purely algebraic thing, Algeb purely algebraic. And of course, something which is purely algebraic will have no obstacle to, from moving to some field to another one. I mean, that we will embed the field capital K. We will embed it in C, for instance. So what is its definition? It's a very brutal definition. You have a G, an algebraic group. It has a, connect, a neutral component, G0. So uh, you think of the same picture as before, the classes modulo G0. Now you consider a closed subset 
Zariski clause. Z in G, Zariski clause. So it's going to intersect each, each coset. For some cosets, the intersection will be the full coset. So you count those. That is, you take. So you define the density in G of Z, algebraic density or the risky density, in the following way. Equals. You divide by the total number of cosets, that is G over G0. And here you count number of cosets which are contained in G, in Z. Contained in Z. So that in the picture here, uh, the density should be zero because I've left something else. So to have an interesting picture, you would say Z would, is made of this piece and those little pieces. Then its density would be one third. You cannot dream of a more trivial density. But the fact is that the other, that the other density can be reduced to that one. So that's the next step. So let's start with the, the case of the um, or maybe I give directly the construction. I start with compact group and I can assume it, I am in the analytic field. So we start from G and uh, uh, and row one, row two, uh, over C. No, 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 not over C, over K, which is Eladic. And uh, maps are continuous. As before, we may assume that G is contained. So LAD, by this I mean finite extension of QL. Now we can assume that G is contained in the GL uh, with obvious notation V1, GL V2. And it's closed, of course, because it's compact. And now the first thing you notice is that these things they are capital K analytic uh, manifolds. But in particular, they are also QL manifolds because the capital K manifold has an underlying structure of QL manifold. And for QL groups, it is a theorem analogous to Eddie Cartan, theorem on closed subgroup, that G being closed implies that G is a QL analytic subgroup of that. It would not be true that it's capital K analytic, but we don't mind. We don't. In particular, it's a manifold. It has a natural structure of manifold over QL. So the next step is to show that the density we want to compute, that is the density of this, the, the measure, uh, uh, is equal to some analytic, some uh, Zariski density. So to do that, well, you use the same trick as in the previous parts of the lecture, that is you take the Zariski clover. So now you make the there is heat over. Oh, so that now is a group in uh, GLV1 cross GLV2 viewed now as algebraic groups. Moreover, I'd forgotten to say, but uh, I can see it now, that I could have assumed V1 and V2 are semi-simple because the question is about the trace. That doesn't change. And so uh, G has such an embedding. And so it is a reductive group. That is, the unipotent radical of 
of G is R is 1. So G is reductive, not necessarily correct, connected. It's not, is a reductive, this is called a reductive group. Not necessarily connected. And inside that group sits a, a subspace. The subspace, now we have a subspace of G is R made of the uh, G with a trace row one of G equals trace, well, trace one really. It's not row one anymore. It is, it is the first trace, trace one of G. I'm switching to the uh, to, to the complement of the space I, I wanted. So have that. Now it's a closed subspace, so it has a density in the, this a bit stupid sense of the risky density, and the claim, which is not really hard to prove, but it, it needs some argument. But the claim is that the, the risky density. Of that set which I should have given name, let's say R, of R is the same as a R measure of the closed set defined by trace row one equals trace row two on G. Well, the idea is this, that you, you have these connected components, and you look at the way your original group G intersects them. And uh, um, well, it's an analytic subspace, and there is a rather simple thing about analytic subspaces. Uh, that is, the harm measure is usually zero, except uh, when there in the in interior is not, is not trivial. More precisely, an analytic subspace can always be decomposed into one which is open and closed, and that one you can handle easily, and another one with empty interior, and that one has harm measure zero. So using that, you prove this thing. Now what you do, the next thing you do, is uh, you're going to make a group over C. Well, now you have an algebraic group, so there is no, not much problem. You take your field K and you map it to C. Well, it's possible because of the, uh, uh, an argument on the cardinal number. I mean, the cardinal numbers are the same, so uh, you can do that. And so you transform, you choose any Traditional notation is a yota. So I guess the line is responsible for the yota. So you have a yota. And that transforms your group into a group over C. And uh, you have now a reductive group over C. And note also that your equation here is an equation with coefficients in Q, you see, that's the essential thing. I could have put five times this equals this or cube and so on. As long as I don't put anything irrational, I have no problem. Yota will map it to itself. So you have a reductive group over, over, over C. And when you have a reductive group over C, so let's say H, what you can do is the following. You, and that is Hermann Weil, really. You take H of C. Now it's a complex analytic group, and you take a maximal compact subgroup. You choose one. They are all, conjug they are all conjugate together, so it doesn't matter. Maximal subgroup. And then you show by the same argument as over the Eladic, an argument I have not done, but it, it is the same, that the Zariski density computed in H is the same as the, as the density 
the hard density computed here. So finally, you have connected, you have a kind of chain where you have connected your group over QL with a group over C by some intermediate algebraic situation. And then it's time to stop. Thank you.